Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to uh, uh, continue our workshop from yesterday. Uh, David left off. So um, let's start. Okay. Change. So this is our uh, Creative Common uh, Agreement. Then uh, today's topic, um, we are going to focus on uh, um, data analysis. So um, um, we are going to mirror almost uh, all the schedule we um, have done yesterday. So the first uh, one and a half hour, we are going to um, focus on the uh, omics data science. What's the basic concept? How do we do it? So uh, there's a lot of the concepts that's this quite a, a strong patterns across all the omics data analysis. There's also something more unique to metabolomics. So I'm going to um, uh, go through this. So the next uh, uh, session is on uh, very specifics for uh, functional analysis and raw spec processing. And this is more unique to um, uh, metabolomics. After that, it's a lab. And uh, it's similar to yesterday. We're going to have two hours, and we are going to um, go through the uh, four tasks. The last one is the multiomics, and I see we have one and a half hour. So um, let's see how much we can cover because we do a lot of multiomics. I see uh, this morning there's question on that. So uh, let's start. So uh, for the first uh, session is um, uh, basic concepts behind the omics data analysis. So this is a, a very important, and um, uh, if we do the uh, metabol analyst, do the data analysis, a lot of a lot of the uh, reasons and motivations behind this is driven by this concept. So if we uh, understand uh, this concept, we will have a very smooth uh, journey in the uh, lab session. And uh, next one is about p-value, how to do the calculating p-value. So everybody talking about um, t-test ANOVA, which is easy. But uh, when we do omics analysis, there are certain specific uh, things about p-values and how to calculate in when we don't know that the, it's normal or not normal. And we are going to cover um, very commonly used PCA, PLSDA, um, what's the concept, how to use it, how to interpret the result. And we're also going to cover some basic machine learning concept, including clustering, classification, and the performance evaluation. So if you're doing some biomarker analysis, and this is a, a very important. So uh, yesterday, uh, David covered how the data was generated and uh, from NMR, from uh, uh, GCMS, from L LCMS. And uh, uh, so we don't do the hands-on using the machine, but after the raw spectra and you get it. And if you're using a, a MagMet, uh, MagMet and GC outfit or LC outfit, you will get a constitution table. So um, now we have the data. And today's uh, topic is how we get from the data to biology and to patterns, to biomarkers. So I guess most of you, if you are um, doing a research project, this is most uh, time consuming part. And we are going to help you go through this. So um, from the uh, tables or peak list, how do we get the patterns, biomarkers? And uh, this is, uh, we are going to cover in the next session. And uh, then the, in the module six, we are going to focus on how do we get from this uh, significant uh, uh, compounds or, uh, or peaks and to the functions. So uh, that's uh, covered in the two modules. Now, uh, here is an overview of omics data analysis. So um, we covered yesterday about how data was generated uh, in metabolomics. So we see there's NMR, LC, and GC. And if we go beyond metabolomics, we all see a lot of, lot of data generated by next generation sequencing, which is you'll get, get some fast Q files and need to do some risk mappings and stuff. And there's also a lot of the studies on using imaging diagnosis or stuff. So this data is very platform specific. You need to design specific algorithm to process a raw data and generate a table. Once you have that table, and now we can use a variety of the statistical and the machine learning algorithms 
to actually understand the data. And we can do a simple ones like t-test ANOVA. We can do more advanced clustering and classification, which we are going to cover soon. And after that, we want to understand what's behind these patterns and what are the potential biomarkers and what are their performances. So this one is in module six. And further down, there's more unique specific analysis, which we are not going to cover. But the uh, uh, majority is that stats functions, OK? That's the main uh, shared pattern. So if we focus on the statistical data analysis, and uh, the statistical data analysis also have four major steps. And uh, the first one is how you put your data into computer memory. So computer, you can apply a lot of the methods on the data. OK, this one is actually seems simple, but actually uh, quite challenging, especially for beginners. Uh, computer and the human is quite different. They expect different things. And uh, we can visually um, correct or, or understand, but computer had to be really specific, fit what they need. And so this part is uh, how do we prepare the data and for metabolist. Then after we upload the data, next one is actually how do we uh, visualize the data and doing a quality checking. And this is a very, very uh, important. Uh, we know garbage in and garbage out. And the data analysis takes a lot of time. So we must make sure data is OK before we spend that time. So uh, also quality checking requires a lot of the, um, understanding about what's important, how the experimental design. So uh, this part is uh, require a lot of the both statistical understanding and your data experimental design and which machine, which type of the uh, instrument used. So uh, and the QC, if you use QC. After that, we would like to uh, do the data normalization. Data normalization is part of the uh, uh, procedures to help you improve the data. So some of the um, uh, most of the data you generated nowadays, especially in the metabolomic center, like TMIC, is high quality, and you just need to improve and further make it more compatible, like a normal distribution, make it more normalized. But in some uh, cases, if the data quality is not good, and you need to use some batch corrections and the mission value imputations to improve it. And the last part is that data is clean, data is high quality, and data is normally distributed, hopefully. And we are going to apply a lot of machine learning and classification, and we're going to spend most time trying to understand the, these patterns. So, uh, uh, so keep this in mind. All these steps you cannot miss. You cannot just read in data directly go to um, the stats or functions, which you could uh, uh, um, get some result that's not reliable. So this step is really common, not just specific for metabolomics. Now we focus on uh, how to prepare uh, uh, data and uh, uh, and what's the main path we want to go through. And the data input for almost any of the machine learning or, or, or um, data analysis require one is that your data that con contains a, a table that's actually quantitative, it's mirrored. For instance, in metabolomics for concentration, target metabolomics is concentrations. And on target, um, its intensity is relatively uh, relative intensity from peaks or MR beans. So this is the data you married from machine. Then there's another data called the metadata. We here we call it why. Why is it your your study design like um, healthy um, disease or group one, group two, or um, time series. So this is your experimental de design. So both X and Y must be understood by the computers to do data analysis. And from this two type of data, what we want to get is uh, biomarkers, uh, clusters, and uh, some understanding how they uh, can rules or models. So a lot of things can be done. So this is uh, in between is what we try to accomplish today. That's a journey. So preparing data. And uh, X uh, data is a data table I just mentioned, and the most of the table uh, we will use should be continuous, and um, because that's uh, intensities or the concentrations. If you're doing a next generation sequencing, 
and you can think this is uh, um, uh, the count and the count data is uh, is uh, integers. So you can see the top, which is uh, from uh, RN6 data, and uh, all of them as a count. You see it count two, five, one hundred. So uh, count data and uh, uh, continuous data is uh, is statistically they should treat with different um, algorithms. And uh, continuous, you can use a normal distribution. Count data, you by default people think as a Poisson distribution, and uh, but nowadays you can do normalization, actually convert the count data into continuous uh, uh, range to do the similar analysis. But overall, that you really need to pay attention to what type of data, because it requires some pre-data treatment. Now, here's uh, why the metadata. So metadata is uh, about your study design, and you can actually uh, label it any way you want. A zero, one, yes, no, case and control. And um, in general, you should use a very descriptive and a very concise label so you can understand and when you plot in that plot it's also informative people can guess what it is if it's very long it's that contains some uh, empty space or, or stuff it can be um, cut off so uh, although it's uh, okay to use any things just try to think a bit about what's the best label and the next one is nominal data and usually this is for more than two groups and uh, uh, for example, um, low, medium, high, and uh, also they contain some something that the order actually making some sense. And in statistical analysis or visualization, and the tool will respect such order if this is indicated. And uh, so um, this is um, ordinal data. Um, so the other one we talk about is multi-groups. So so it's basically more than two groups we can apply, but um, uh, if you have orders, you need to specify this order preference. And uh, that's, so on the right-hand side, you see uh, some examples. The first top one is just one single uh, factors. It's, uh, you have your sample and you have your factors. The label is called disease. Some is control, some is QC, some is CD. This is one factor because this is just one column. But below, there's uh, multiple columns. Uh, from sample, you have about four. But if you're in the clinical settings, you can have 20, 30, and a lot. So this is getting very complicated. For my type analyst, we really try to be uh, as uh, accommodating as uh, flexible. And so if we just have one type of the factors or just one column, we can directly embed in this design within your uh, data table. So if, because every label is labeled the samples, so the samples can be in the rows, samples can be in the columns. So label must directly follow that sample. So in the, uh, in the, um, uh, this, uh, top left and we see sample in the rows. So you put the samples directly follow that second row, uh, second column. So sample and sample label. And in the bottom one, you have the sample uh, in the column. Uh, so each uh, first row is sample name, second row is a uh, is, uh, label. So make sure it is uh, changed, uh, transposed and do it consistently. Once you have multiple uh, factors, you need to use a table to describe. So you need to upload the data X and upload the data Y. Um, but for today, I guess uh, what uh, our uh, lab is going to focus on the simple ones, because yesterday we generated basically have one uh, one factors is lung cancer or uh, control. So this is uh, just pay attention. When you upload data, you also need to pay attention to your samples in the rows or the in the col columns. So. Uh, we need to be aware of what uh, we are talking about. Sample is sample, so it's consistent. But when you're talking about the metabolites and the metabolites genes, we talk about it is called the features or variables. This this uh, commonly in machine learning stats is features or variables. And uh, uh, dimension dimension is number of features. So uh, if you we have one hundred metabolites married, it's one hundred dimensions. Okay. And this is uh, univariate, and basically we're talking about uh, 
we analyze one compounds or one genes or one peaks at a time with regarding to the class labels. So it's called a univariate. And multivariate is that we consider multiple ones. Usually in, in this case, we usually try to, like in the PCA, we consider all the uh, variables, all the metabolites uh, simultaneous. So, uh, um, so multivariate or high dimensional data, it is really uh, for omics data because we are uh, talking about hundreds or thousands of uh, uh, compounds or genes or peaks being married and we analyze them simultaneously. And I re uh, we receive um, a lot of the questions about uh, <laughs> uh, how do we do some basic data checking and uh, understanding individual data. So although we focus on the global, but we have to understand individually how data is described. And uh, um, so if we try to understand individual features like uh, glucose, and uh, we marry them, what it looks like. And uh, one is we talk about mean uh, or median. So this is called a central tendency. And uh, it's in the center of the data. And the variability, the whole spread is the data. So if all the population, we have a, a like some, like a normal distribution, we know they actually there's have a um, meaningful uh, kind of the summary using mean. This is a, um, um, very uh, useful for statistical analysis data summary. And you can see on the right-hand side, if we plotting all these numbers in a, in a row, you see that it's center actually meaningful because center is actually concentrated. If you choose use the mean or median, you can use it as a representative uh, number to do a lot of computing. And plus the uh, spread, basically variance. So it's very meaningful why we do the normal distribution, because the mean and the variance actually capture the key characteristics of this data. And uh, in the below, you can see this distribution is more un uniformly di distributed. So in this case, and uh, uh, you want to find the patterns or want to summarize the mean, it will not be that useful. Why? Because they're not centered. They're not condensed to that region. And you are not uh, using one or two values to capture the whole characteristics of this data. So it's uh, distribution is important and most distributions try to use a mean and a variance, which is best is for normalized data. You can see like this. Now at the bottom, you can see data is skewed. It's all left skewed to the, to the left. So um, how do we do that? We actually, uh, with, for the skewed data, we can do a log transformation or sometimes auto scaling. We can make it more normally distributed. So um, visualizing this data and understanding how the data is distributed will help you how to choose which normalization algorithm. So uh, spread of the data or distribution of data, we, we have some other uh, mirrors uh, like a quantile normalization, basically uh, uh, each 10% or, or quantile, uh, what is uh, the range looks like. And also uh, IQR is called the inter-quantile range. So uh, this is important uh, <clears throat> summary of the data. So uh, here, if we think <clears throat> about data is not normally distributed, we plot in this normally distributed data as a box plot or box and whisk plot, it will look like uh, this. And this is a median. And if it's really normal, median and mean will be very close. And this uh, interquantile range, this is a uh, uh, quantile is uh, uh, like 25% uh, above and 25% below. And now it's uh, um, uh, now it's uh, like uh, uh, further extending high and low as medium and the maximum. So this one is a very good summary of the data. And um, if uh, your data looks like this and uh, you can really comfortable, it uh, is uh, normally distributed. So um, uh, this is uh, quite a useful box plot. Sometimes people actually plot, uh, plot in the dots on top of the box plot, make it more informative. So this is very, um, a good visualization, just make sure you can interpret the box plot intuitively and help you to guide yourself what it, uh, what's the method to use. And uh, mean and variance is two important uh, parameters. So mean summarizes the central tendency and variance sum central summarizes the spread. So if you compare two populations and the mean is very different and, uh, and variance is very narrow, basically they are very two different things on the top uh, uh, on the top right like this. 
So mean is very summarized in this data group and summarized in this group, and they are so tight in individual. So the p-value will be very, very close to zero. It's very significant. Um, but when they have uh, same difference in mean, but the spread, the variance is, uh, is wide, they all overlap. So some of the positive and negative won't, you, you'll have some fuzzy judgment. So uh, because in this region, there's you're not sure which group they belong. So this one going to reflect in your p-values. P-value won't be that significant, right? So this is clearly, we, we are talking about uh, what's, why we care about the mean and the variance because they are important for the decisions and stats just summarizing them into uh, some measurement and uh, reflecting this uh, distribution. So normal or Gaussian distribution, why we care about that? Because uh, they are just um, really um, kind of in almost all the data, biological data or physical data measurement, once we get enough large data, we found that they are normally distributed. So uh, this one is uh, quite a amazing a discovery. And, um, and almost we get, get a, a certain number of the data high good enough and we do some pre-treatment, we found it more or less follow the same thing. So also not only normal distribution is common in biology and life sciences, in, um, and they are also computationally so efficient. And once um, this is, a, we don't, we know this, is what this for example, this is a height of a class. And if you plot in uh, um, like uh, 13 or 14 people or 100 people, you will see this always normally distributed. There's some people who are very high and outlier, but the majority will follow this distribution. And this is formula how the normal distribution is there. It's very seems complex, but we never need to memorize it because computer deal with normal distribution is so efficient. And this is um, a lot of advantage. And, uh, uh, but if, most times if we do in omics data, especially a lot of the um, studies, and a uh, mix of different uh, populations, disease, and the developmental stage, we do see a lot of other normal uh, not distributions. And the uni model is quite common, by bi model is quite common. And uh, you see the RNA cells, different populations, and each of them is actually more or less normal. But you mix two different populations, you, you can see the two mode. It's, it's very uh, intriguing when you see this. And skewed is quite common, and I already show metabolomic data, and some of the, a lot of them quite skewed, and we need to do some log transformation. So um, data normalization is really, really try to, uh, try to make the data more normally distributed. So um, because a lot of downstream analysis is using this assumption, so we cannot feed them directly the raw data, so we want to make sure they are feeding the right data so the algorithm is happy and the result is more reliable. And uh, so this is uh, the step we want to do normalization. We call it normalization, but it's a lot of time also relate to some batch corrections or, or the uh, stuff. So we, we just capture them transformation. So, and uh, here is the common, they use the approaches, skewed distribution, and uh, log transformation. And this is a quite quite uh, common, almost uh, you, uh, for almost uh, all the um, metabolomics data, blood concentrations or stuff. And uh, we feel it's skewed and uh, after log and it feels normal. So it's uh, usually it's your first lines of choice. So uh, do the log first, do not try to do it very fancy at the beginning, uh, try to, keep the data raw and try to do a simple ones and gradually increase the uh, complexity and because uh, more things you apply layer and layer and it will hard to interpret also introduce some overfitting issue we are going to discuss so um here is that uh, real data and we don't have a lot of a lot of samples you can see it but uh, we can we there's no much guarantee you get a beautiful normal distribution if you have like a uh, 10 or 20 samples, um, but we can still apply. You can see it's getting better. So overall, the log transformation is um, is a safe bet. So you don't want to do the raw data process. So one reason we metabolic analyst is very popular uh, early days is of, uh, one thing is we are uh, supporting a very uh, um, uh, large number of data normalization. 
why we do that is because uh, there's so many different uh, um, type of data and uh, normalization of method and uh, and a lot of publications actually claim which one is better which is uh, 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 is more suitable so in order to accommodate in different needs we actually try to capture that uh, different type of data and we implement them and people can choose Overall, that seems a lot, but uh, you always starting from log, from very basic ones. You can do some centering, but if you do have internal standard, have something, just uh, choose them appropriately. So they are um, not that uh, complicated. The, every um, option actually have a reason behind it. So there's uh, a lot of people actually really uh, like certain normalization because this is their study design. They have that internal built in. So. Um, uh, if you have a very general one, just start with log and see the result and then and choose another one and see how it looks like. So this is not uh, no hard rules for uh, across all the data. The normalization is really depending on the instrument, depending on the data. And uh, so uh, if we talking about uh, data uh, QC and normalization and uh, normalized, up to normalized, cleaned, and this is the time we are going to understand the data. And uh, how do we understand? We use uh, simple stats, advanced uh, machine learning, visualization. So this is a really, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time to do. And um, before we really get in there, and we need to understand p-values. So everybody thinks they understand p-values. Uh, actually, I receive a lot of questions from uh, users. They ask, how do you interpret uh, when to make these series? So p-value is very critical and help us to simplify their uh, uh, simplify the understanding of how it works. And we always want to use, can we just use p-values to help us making these series? And, uh, and um, I always hesitate to give that answer. It's because um, at the end of the day, it's biology really matters, it's science matters. Stats just help you uh, simplify uh, certain uh, data and summary. So, uh, over reliance on p value is going to be um, have these pitfalls, and there's actually a recent movement. Always, we need to be cautious about uh, re over reliance on p values. Always consider about your studies and context, other evidences. And in the future, we, if we really talk about um, multi omics and uh, um, stuff, and uh, we just cannot get enough number of replicate to get at the p-value requirement. So overall that we actually have a lot of evidence and uh, point to the same thing. And we know logically it's uh, convincing and meaningful, but it's probably cannot be captured using p-values, which is designed for a lot of the uh, replicates, uh, repetitions and uh, all these things. Um, but uh, seeing that, we still need to understand how we interpret p-values, how we can use p-values to help us. So overall, that uh, we want to mirror a subset of sample. And from that subset of sample, we want to extrapolate to the whole population. For example, biomarkers, it is, you find from uh, like a, a, a group of patients, and you think that the biomarkers can be used for the whole population, right? So. Uh, Unless we measure the whole population, we cannot see it for sure. So we're just using that uh, subset of data to extrapolate the result. And certainly there's a probability. So uh, what's that probability? And uh, it's depending where we sampled. If we see the place, it's very tight, we have high confidence. If the po we see it's very widespread, we have low confidence. So this is, a, I mentioned about the spread of the population, how heterogeneous, how how homogeneous of the population. So we never able to um, say oh, for sure. And we need a certain mirror of this uncertainty and the p-values help, help us uh, give us such a, how to say, such a comfort. So, um, so that's how, how p-values in normally interpreted. So in a <clears throat> uh, common, they use like called a frequency p-values, like t-test ANOVA. The p-value is, is defined as a probability that the observed result uh, uh, how, was how obtained by chance. Basically, if we repeat the experiment uh, um, uh, sufficient time, what's the chance we get this just uh, by this random? If the signal is not real and we actually get it for 
uh, just by random chance, just what's that chance? If the chance is very, very low, and we think we can ignore this, we think that uh, what we observed is, is likely to be real. So we basically, we, uh, <clears throat> we reject our hypothesis and uh, we, we, we think there's an effect. So this is a, a very traditional p-value. And the most time, this is how we're going to interpret. But how do we calculate p-values? And uh, because we actually don't do the experiment uh, repeat, repeat enough. <clears throat> so um, if the data is followed normal distribution and we actually can, um, can use the normal distribution and, uh, and get the p-value with probability. So it's uh, before old days and we can actually look into a, a dictionary and we get uh, where the, uh, where the, mean and standard deviation, we get uh, p-values. But nowadays we all have computers and we can uh, just uh, just get it immediately from the measurement. So that's uh, very cool if we, our data is really robust. And for um, this is, um, um, we are very comfortable. And here I'm going to introduce uh, one value called the empirical p-value. Uh, this is uh, very important. Uh, because um, some advanced features in metabolic analyst uh, started calculating the empirical p-values. And empirical p-values try to address the issues related to this uh, um, model-based p-values, such as using the normal distribution, because we know sometimes uh, they are not normally distributed. Actually, we don't know what the distribution it is. And uh, can we compute this uh, p-values based on data itself rather than assume they are normally distributed because we know the reality is very different and very complex. Assume normal is make a lot of people uncomfortable because when we plot in the data, we see the distribution is, is not normal. So uh, even you try different normalization approaches, but how can we calculate it? So uh, if nowadays we have the um, powerful computers and we can actually do the uh, do the simulation easily. And we can actually derive this now distribution from the data itself and uh, calculate that p-values. So this p-value is not model-based. We call it empirical p-value because it's based on data. So uh, and our now hypothesis is that um, there's no effect. So uh, basically the treatment and the uh, control have the same, same, the treatment have no effect. So basically treatment or not treatment is same, okay? That's the now hypothesis. If we accept this, then basically we can shuffle the label and uh, and see whether the difference is the same, okay? And uh, so um, uh, this is very simple just because if we assume there's no effect, so class label became not meaningful, treated or no treated is the same. So in that case, we can always shuffle the label and uh, calculate the difference and compare with original one. And we can repeat many times. We're talking about the thousands or millions of times. Then we found out how much different from the original data versus the shuffled data, okay? This is very simple. And it's uh, um, mentally we think it's simple, but when you do it, it's uh, calculate manually, it's hard, but for computers, it's so easy. And uh, I just hope you conceptually find it simple and uh, you can just uh, use the empirical p-value, try to uh, interpret it intuitively. So here is uh, the case and control, this original uh, score we married and um, some, the mean between the case and control is about 0 0.5, 0 0.541. And uh, if we assume there's no effect and we just shuffle them, and you can see that some of the, 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 the sample is go to a case from, see here is one and uh, uh, one to nine is in case and 10 to 18 is the control, right? And the case mean and control mean is below and you see the difference like this. But we will shuffle them. You can see uh, from uh, uh, some of the 15 and 17 and 16, they became case and 13, they became case and control and mix. Uh, this is permutation number one. We just randomly shuffle, random shuffle, because uh, if there's no effect, the difference between me and uh, between me of case and control should be similar, okay? So we just do it. Actually, we can do it uh, hundreds, thousands or millions of times. And uh, 
and we just continue to calculate the difference, how much they are. And then we plot in the difference. So this, in this case, uh, we know this original difference uh, from uh, observed the control and the case the, before you permute. But once you permute and you see a lot of difference between the mean of two groups, it's, it's, it's distributed like a normal, and which I'm not surprised. So a lot of the result you're going to like this. So if we talk about a 5%, if you repeat a, a uh, hundred times 0.05, uh, one five times, like by chance, you'll get observed that's um, have a bigger difference. And where it's located, you can see it's located on here. So uh, uh, this is uh, like 19, uh, if they say 1,000 times, 900 and uh, mm, 15 times uh, below here, about five times higher. So, but this is your original one. And uh, it is really, really confident. There's an effect. Okay. Yes. Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. The question is uh, how many permutation we should do? So the answer is uh, the more the better. But it is depending how big is your sample size. If you have uh, six control, six, six disease, and you can exhaust all the combinations, uh, probably just a uh, hundred ish, you want to be able to get a very high significant uh, p values, even the effect is strong, just because you have a less number of samples. But once you have more number of samples, you shuffle is, uh, you do the random shuffling, the combination is different. You can get a very rich distribution like what's shown here. So this one, I think is about, uh, 14, 14 or 13, 13, uh, it's, it's okay. But if you have really 10, 10, and you want to get a very uh, good distribution just because the sample size is too small, you can try, but it... Just like thinking you still think that a lot of people don't realize is that if you do a thousand times permutation, the most precise p value that you can get is 0 0.001, right? Because it's a thousand. And so if you do 10,000, you're going to have to repeat it. Yeah, yeah. So it's really up to you like what level of share is there. So if you want a really, if you have super strong effect sizes, and you want to be able to calculate, you know, a p value consistently with size, then you're going to need to do like yeah. <laughs> so uh, the okay. The question is, uh, how many? Uh, you know, what's the number of permutations to get a sufficiently high, uh, significant p values? And uh, you can see there's some some of the uh, already hints below. So we can never get p value equal zero in empirical p value because uh, when even your data is large enough, and just because if you do one million permutations and you never see any of the permutations higher than original data. You can only see the p-values less than 0 0.00, probably 601. What if you're doing a one more permutation up to one million and you get that high? So, so we're never able to be say that, but we are pretty confident that p-value is less than that number, okay? And sometimes people will just adding one padding like here to get the p-values uh, uh, get around because sometimes you get to zero will have some computational issues but overall that um, we are fine if you can data is relatively large you have more than one thousand permutations and we usually uh, have a good feeling this is a very promising result okay um yeah um, so the question was how the threshold was calculated. And here it is, uh, we don't uh, have a just calculate a threshold. We just plot in a normal p-value threshold, like 0 0.05, which it means if you repeat the experiment uh, 100 times, five times, you can get by random, you can get the significant higher than this. We just here, we plot this 0 0.05 cutoff and, uh, and you can see about 5% of times on higher than this. This is from 1000. So we're talking about five zero times higher than this. 
and this is your original data. So this is how the normal uh, traditional p-value plotted within this empirical p-value calculation. So if we accept that the same 0.05 cutoff, and this is where they are located. So interpretation empirical p-value and the regular p-value is the same, okay? Almost just uh, like this. So how do we think about p-values? Uh, empirical p-value is more robust because it uh, don't have a distribution assumption. And uh, if there's some hidden correlations or something, and we can address it because when you're doing a permutation and uh, actually everything is more or less uh, <laughs> been uh, contained when the data being considered uh, because we driven by that data. What's the disadvantage is require a large number of samples. So I'm talking about at least 20, 25 per group. Once you have less than that, you don't have enough combinations to get that. Computationally intensive, it may not be a big issue because nowadays computer is so powerful. And uh, But the last one you keep in mind, if your data actually can be normalized, fit into a normal distribution, it is much more sensitive. You get a strong p-value um, than using a permutation base just because uh, quantitative models, statistical models, uh, is uh, always more, have more powers compared to non-parametric as long as you can get them the distribution fit into that model, okay? Parametric is always more powerful than non-parametric if the model distribution fit into that parametric. So it's really, uh, you should be uh, clear on that. <clears throat> so multiple testing issues, and uh, uh, we, uh, we are doing omics data. We have hundreds of thousands of variables. So we're doing tests one by one. And, uh, and each time we accept if we repeat the experiment enough, and we will by chance see the significant result. So using a 0.05 as the cutoff, and if we have 10,000 features like peaks or genes, we will see 500 just by significant, will be significant just by chance, because this is what we defined, what's the p-value. Uh, repeat enough time, we will get that. So we repeat 10,000 times on each one. So this one is really a uh, bother uh, statisticians because this is their define. And when they define this, they didn't think about uh, omics data. Now we're doing omics data. We are doing exactly like this. So the chance alone, we will have a very high number of the significant uh, uh, p-values by chance. And how we address that? Uh, if we go back to the traditional stats, we do the uh, Banfaroni correction. So we just make the cutoff more stringent. If we do that uh, 10,000, we just divide the p-value from 05 by that uh, uh, time we've been, we tested. So the p-value cutoff will be, become uh, five zeros be, behind, divided by this number of the genes tests. So make it very stringent. In theory, it looks fine, but in practice, if we do that, we will we'll have nothing to work on because it's too stringent. Most of um, uh, clinical data, most experiments usually don't have enough uh, effects that's not that high. So uh, uh, again, uh, stats have their own uh, operations. This is how stats works, but we are biologists and we know uh, a lot of things uh, uh, can be reason, can be actually uh, meaningful. And uh, so if using a stringent uh, cutoff, we cannot move on. And uh, that's, that's kill our research. Um, but we still need to really control this uh, 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 false discovery or random chance. So another popular one is called the false discovery rate. as in Benjamin Hodgeberg. That's our BHD uh, by abbreviation. So in metabolism, almost if you don't see uh, specifically all false discovery rate by BH method. So the interpretation is very easy. Um, FDR 0.05 means uh, whatever you de de declared as significant, 5% of them will be false positive. So this is much uh, more acceptable. So uh, now we are about to move to a more high uh, multivariate, but before we end, we need to uh, um, uh, just summarize what do we usually do 
and we should always be doing start from universe normalization then we try the univariate because it's simple it's robust it's actually meaningful okay t-test ANOVA and uh, from two groups or multi groups then we apply um, do a multi-test adjustment okay then we um, uh, basically try to understand whether this there is a significant number or significant or whether this making sense or not so this is a very basic uh, baseline check uh, uh, check and uh, now how we move on uh, how can we visualize all the samples and uh, thinking all of them together and this is a uh, uh, more to machine learning or uh, multivariate statistics so um, a lot of the things um, uh, what we try to do is uh, borrow uh, a lot of the uh, concept uh, from uh, computer science and um, of course the stats they do have their own uh, set of the tools to um, help with high dimensional but again uh, a lot of the the traditional statistical for multivariate is still not a, uh, how to say not a fit in the current omics scale we we just cannot get that number of the replicates uh, this is a really uh, if you read some literature it's called n um, much less than p n is the number of the samples and p is number of the features so most multivariate statistics they have a degree of freedom and if you want to estimate the co coefficient and uh, or number of the parameters you need to have the the replicates almost uh, double um, or triple or i don't know uh, the empirical rule than that it's almost impossible you think about um, uh, genes you have 25,000 genes you need to have uh, a lot thousands of the samples it's uh, really hard to get so um uh, current practice is that we uh, gradually move more to a uh, pattern recognition machine learning and dimensionality reduction dimensionality reduction uh, such a pca or psda is it's more from machine learning or camo 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 uh, informatics so it's a uh, um this is a uh, this is a big picture about where we are standing. So um, 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 so um, artificial intelligence and uh, um, machine learning, and uh, here is clustering, classification, regression, and uh, we we already talked a little bit on hypothesis testing because all the p value we're talking about is related to hypothesis testing. And uh, traditional stats, we talk about, uh, uh, I assume everybody is more or less comfortable with t-test ANOVA, okay? Parameter estimation, and this is really traditional stats. We talk about p-value mainly focused on that. And what we are going to focus on the clustering and the classification. And uh, there's a lot of the area called machine learning artificial intelligence we are not going to touch um, just because we don't have time. But this is uh, really the, the basic things we need to, understand this before we move to more advanced and there's a lot of the tutorials on that in the future so machine learning keep in mind uh, we have um, now have three uh, categories uh, if we think about ai and uh, but traditionally we only have two categories called unsupervised and supervised unsupervised is to really try to understand the data itself we don't consider about uh, class labels we don't consider uh, whether it's control, whether disease. We just want to see how the data is distributed, whether there's patterns who's similar to each other. So it is inherent data structure. And uh, we want to do the data mining. And the other one is called a supervised learning. Supervised learning is actually try to find the data, which features, which patterns correlate with the, with the class labels. So you tell the algorithm, try to find it uh, features in X that relate to Y. This is supervised. And unsupervised, really, you try to find an interesting pattern within X, and they totally ignore Y. So this is a really the main difference between supervised and unsupervised. The last one we we started talking about is called reinforcement learning, and this is really a not a, a, a simple one step. It's a multi-step, a task oriented, and maximize the reward. For example, how do you drive safely and uh, how do you play games there's so many uh, things so you can imagine because it's multitask and very complex and uh, there's a lot of explorations and strategy building 
So it is it is not it is really related to AI and uh, uh, play go and uh, drive a car. So there's a lot of literature there. We are not going to touch. So we are really just looking for unsupervised supervised. So unsupervised data uh, uh, analysis, and we talk about two things. One is called the clustering. One is called the dimensionality reduction. And uh, clustering is try to um, find the samples of features who are most similar to each other. And uh, if they are similar to each other, we can almost simplify the data. Like if one, um, all the features are similar to each other, we can almost use a representative tool to, to summarize, to understand. So it's uh, really help us to uh, reduce the dimensionality uh, by you considering each cluster as a, as a unit. And dimensionality reduction is uh, try to um, um, find some new directions that we can project data uh, to that. And uh, for example, principal component analysis. And we are going to focus on principal component analysis in um, uh, uh, in uh, later. And so here is we are going to focus on how to do clustering and then focus on how to do dimensionality reduction. So clustering is very simple. And we just want to find the uh, find, uh, samples of features who are most similar to each other, then we just merge them. Then once they merge, they become a new unit, new sam new uh, merged sample. Then we find out what's the remaining one. So overall, that we repeat the process until we um, found some enough uh, clusters or groups that um, we found that we can understand. So clustering it really reduced the uh, samples of features to some blocks that's the most similar to each other within each block. So within metabolic analyst or actually within the literature, what's the two most commonly used clustering algorithms? One is called a hierarchy of clustering and basically starting from um, each individual samples of features, then you build it all the way to the number one, everything merged. So during the process, you, they, are, they are going to gradually increase this, the, the, the hierarchy all the way from the top to the bottom. So this is a quite, a, you will see a lot of the beautiful figures generated by that. The other one called the keying or partitioning method. They basically give them a number. Hey, I want uh, the samples to in two or three groups and they will try to do it. So, um, and uh, some of the uh, classroom algorithms actually allow you to have a fuzzy mapping. So one group can potentially belong to two clusters. So it's uh, slightly more advanced, but it's uh, a lot of things uh, it's possible. So we are going to touch in the first is on hierarchical cl clustering. So um, uh, this one is very simple and we find the object and merge them and repeat until it's done. So overall that uh, we start from the, like from the bottom, uh, every samples or every features, then marry a similarity and uh, until we done, uh, done this. So it's a very, um, Intuitive, let's say that it's uh, just boring if you repeat again and again. Um, but for computer, they, they are really good. Okay, uh, I see there's some <laughs> uh, formatting from um, um, the uh, from the slides. Uh, so overall, the, if we want to the clustering, we need to two measurement. One is uh, um, what's the similarity between the samples. Okay, we, uh, this time we are assuming we want to find the samples who are most similar to each other. And uh, we can do, of course, switch samples to features. Basically, you can cluster in, uh, a sample, a data by the samples or by the features. So uh, X and Y, they, they are both okay. So it's here we use the samples. Then we need to measure uh, uh, how similar to samples, how similar to clusterings. And uh, we are going to, uh, calculating from the lowest, then we merge, then we, uh, after merging, and we do the whole thing. So this one is uh, just a repeat, repeat, and until everything uh, finish. And uh, how do we calculate similarity, which is uh, easy, we just compute an Euclidean distance. And uh, this is Euclidean distance, basically, we are talking about a, a vector, vector means that you have a whole um, all the measurement, for example, this is a sample uh, A, this sample B, and uh, all this metabolites in the sample A going to be here. All the metabolites sample B uh, going to be here. And you just from a compound A, 
versus the compound A in uh, in sample A to common B and just add them together as you play in the distance. It's just so many multi dimensions, not just two. We're talking about uh, um, all the dimensions. Uh, dimensions number is the same as the number of features. So it's very easy for a computer to calculate that. And that's Euclidean distance. And the other one is called Pearson correlation. So um, Pearson correlation is that you uh, actually have a um, uh, center and see how you uh, uh, vary it regarding to that center. So you can see uh, uh, it is a global center, then this uh, uh, individually how they uh, change with regarding to that. So it's Pearson. So the Pearson uh, correlation uh, similarities and, uh, have, can be positive, can be negative. So basically positive means you change it on the same, uh, same direction and uh, negative means opposite direction. And uh, you can see um, here is a, a Pearson correlation. So um, this uh, completely synchronized and completely opposite. So all of this is meaningful. So it, it, it's just a random down to or not meaningful, but it's a, a change um, opposite or, or, or similar. It gives you a strong, strong feelings about they're biologically relevant. They are either co-regulated or maybe one uh, inhibit the other one. So it's a really, uh, really um, uh, meaningful signals. Now, after we uh, calculate a similarity, how we actually, uh, we put them in a cluster. Now we need to actually calculate the cluster and put this cluster, new cluster with uh, remaining. And how do we um, link the clusters? How do we calculate distance between clusters? So, um, uh, there's different or reasonable dis reasoning. For example, a single linkage as a method, they basically choose the distance is the minimum similarity between the members of two clusters. So here, that's uh, uh, this cluster C1, cluster C2, and they choose one close to each other. They call it, this is the distance. This one is called a single linkage, okay? Um, why I mention this is because it's so common and you will see such parameter in metabolism. So make sure you are not too scared with this number uh, name. A single linkage means they are very uh, using the closest data point. And if you choose this parameter, you tend to have some long chains and uneven distributed. So it is just uh, uh, the um, commonly used. The other one is called complete linkage and they choose the furthest members within the two clusters, then, then use that as distance. They tend to generate a lot of clumps. So uh, uh, definitely this, it's been used. And uh, uh, you can see sometimes uh, different uh, um, linkage give very different patterns. Some is more meaningful biologically. OK, uh, another one is very clear. It's called average. So how about we just don't use any member? We just calculated the center and the computed the center. Uh, distance between the two centers is called the average group linkage. So you can try theoretically, uh, average is more in a, in between. So um, here is the hierarchy clustering if we want to visualize uh, uh, across the samples. And um, if we are starting from um, like uh, uh, merge A and B, similar, then A, B became one simple one, they merge in C and A, B, C, D, E, and gradually merge everything iteratively, and we build a hierarchical heat map. And you can see the heat map uh, like this across samples. So if the samples, I like see the bottom, uh, this is more like cancer, this is more healthy, you will see that uh, have a strong signal for you to interpret. And uh, some of them is, oh, this is small cl clustering, this is immune cells, uh, response. This is a uh, metabolomics. So you feel excited because this, the genes or metabolites responding have certain patterns that update and with regarding to the sample label or with regarding to the time point. So a lot of times computer can do a lot of the fancy things, but uh, in the end it's up to you to interpret whether it's meaningful or not. How can I write a beautiful paper? And if you don't have enough biological background, you can totally ignore these patterns and miss the important discoveries. So this is a, what I would like to say is that stats uh, or machine learning is helping you, but not, nobody can replace you. And you have to actually think and observe and spend more time with your data. 
So uh, k-mean clustering is another one is most commonly used for uh, machine learning. And k-mean is, uh, is, uh, is k is the number parameter you should supply. And you can have a k-median clustering. Basically, you, you don't use the mean, you use median. And probably kind of key mode clustering. So the mean is uh, really they use that mean as a, a center to uh, do the clustering. So how do we start? Uh, is uh, first you need to give a number uh, k. And uh, for example, we give k as uh, uh, two uh, from. So we basically we want to build two clusters. And how they try to start is throw two c's on this um, on this data. For example, this is two two c. And every uh, data going to be calculated how close to this two seed. And then uh, based on the threshold, they're going to assign the whole group became a two new uh, cluster. Then after they have new cluster, they're going to update the center. They basically the new cluster have a new center and then redo the assignment. And by it again and again until it's stable, never changes, then it's a key mean. So, so k-mean is very efficient, and the people just uncomfortable with this. How I can choose the initial uh, group k? How do I know that? One thing is that you can use a k uh, cl hierarchical clustering. For example, you see visually, you see, huh, probably just two groups. And some people think, oh, probably five groups. You use this global pattern to guess. And sometimes you actually think, I believe there's five groups because I have five uh, diagnoses. You just force them to do that. So the other one's computational. I can try different grouping, like uh, from two to 15, and uh, compute the homogeneity within each cluster. Probably at a group of five or six, I found that within each cluster, it's very pure and uh, it's very tight. And across different clusters, it became very different. Then there's a mirror, just testing the purity. You will know, okay, data-driven, the K equals five or six. So overall that, uh, yes, there's need some subjectiveness to get set a K, but overall that uh, you have different uh, uh, ways to guess it, okay? That's flexibility actually is a good thing. If you don't have questions, I'm going to continue. Now, next one is go to principal component analysis. So uh, principal component analysis is uh, probably the most widely used multivariate stats in uh, metabolomics. And uh, it projects high dimension data into low dimensions that capture the most variance of data. So this is uh, what they try to do, most variance of the data. And the assumption is clear that variance means biologically important, okay? If you really have a um, study and you're well under control, like E. coli and C. elegans, some other species, and you control it, and the only change is experimental factor and you can actually get a very, very good principal component analysis because experimental factor, that's the only change. So the change of data will be driven by the experimental factor. It's very good. And uh, so this is assumption and uh, you, it's, uh, you need to keep it in mind. But if your data is more observational and you have other factors, so not necessarily it will be captured in the first, uh, it's not necessarily your most variance is really to your uh, interest. Okay, so this is uh, what PCA tried to, to do. So uh, how PCA actually works, and uh, it's, uh, you can always think about uh, like uh, projecting data. And here you show a bagel and project from two different sides. One is like a O shape, one is like a hot dog. And then now you want to choose one dimen low dimension at the, from 3D to 2D, which side you capture, right? We always think the old dimension is probably more informative about the bagel and the better than the uh, hot dog. So we choose from three dimension to two dimension and we still capture the main characteristics of a hot dog, which uh, another characteristic of a bagel, which is ocean. So keep in mind is PCA, once you choose the low dimension, you will lose data, uh, not, at 100% at from completed data, you will lose data, but you focus on data that's most variable. In this case, we focus on O. Okay, we will lose that uh, dimension in the hot dog part, but that's that's unavoidable. And we are talking about high dimensional omics data. And so always a part of the things we will have to ignore and focus on things that are most interesting. <clears throat> so how do we actually calculate PCA? And, uh, you actually don't need to know as long as you can interpret the result. 
but if you really want to know, and here is the details, and you can use in R or writing your own code to actually linearly transform the data and try to capture uh, most variance in the PC1, then then subtract the PC1, then the calculate for PC2, which will capture most of the variance, then PC3, and one by one, and uh, you will get it done. So math is actually PC is not that uh, very deep. It just looks uh, quite uh, horrible, but overall it's uh, it's doable. And uh, I just let you know is uh, my first uh, uh, <clears throat> one is I actually spend time to write that PCA manually and uh, to make sure I understand. So it's uh, it's just make um, me feel comfortable, but uh, eventually interpretation is the same. So you can see um, each uh, principal component is calculated by combining the coefficient with this uh, original, uh, original uh, samples. So the co uh, features, so the coefficient is actually the loading and uh, this new values is a new new coordinate where is it going to be so uh principal component analysis uh, can be com computed on two matrix one is covariance matrix one is correlation matrix so uh, you not necessarily need to understand detail if you do an auto scaling you will get a correlation matrix okay and uh, uh, if you do this and you will pc the principal component you're going to have zero original is at a zero so it's more typically used but if you didn't do the auto scaling the uh, center may not be uh, zero so this is uh, things but overall is we are caring about the relative position between the samples or between the features so whether it's a uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, center is zero zero uh, it's not that critical but if you really did the centering and using the scaling it will be at zero so that's i'm saying this uh, um principal component analysis is all about how the relative position samples within each other. And uh, this is a score plot in the PCA. And this telling about uh, how the samples are similar to each other. And uh, the this is the loading plot. Loading plot is a coefficient, which uh, I showed the multiply and, and cause these uh, samples to be in these patterns. So this, uh, <clears throat> this loading is will be positively correlated with samples here because they are positive and drive this one here. And this loading is going to be positively correlated here. So more or less <clears throat> PCA, why it's, why it's being popular is because it's very intuitive and uh, uh, similarity and the drivers, the features that drive them is, uh, um, is uh, here. So scores is about the samples and loading is about the features that are underlying them. So the same direction and the same location, they are positive correlated. And it's, um, and this one's uh, have the high, this feature here, gonna have a positive high, co co high concentration in this blue group. And this one gonna have a high concentration in this potential in this samples group because they are driving them. So they are really most abundant. If you are uh, doing data analysis, <clears throat> using metabolism, you can see this, okay? So they are positively correlated. This one drive uh, this one. It's, here is especially co almost so linear. And this one going to drive this group. You will see that why it's driving because that is most abundant in that group and uh, probably least abundant in this group. So the opposite. So this is uh, a PCA. I hope you feel comfortable. And just because uh, uh, it's intuitive, it's useful, and it's uh, also reliable. It's um, uh, how it's been used is overview, outlier de detection, and looking for relationship between the samples or variables. So uh, here the, you can actually almost swap them. So who is similar to each other is similar to, uh, close to each other is similar to each other, okay? Samples close to each other, similar to each other. And features close to each other, similar to each other, okay? It's just that we want to, we use this. Uh, uh, you can think about the data table. You can rotate them and uh, calculate them and which one called the score which one loading is, is really depending uh, your purpose so so pca <clears throat> uh, is um, unsupervised and if your data is really uh, have a um, uh, experiment that causes the most variance and pc will capture it you will get a good separation you will good, get a good interpretation which features that change the most as drive the separation. And you, you can almost uh, write your paper. And of course you need to do some functional interpretation 
in the next module we're going to discuss. Um, but a lot of times uh, it's not that easy. A lot of data you have no control and the clinical data, observational data, a wild field study data, and you don't have good separation. And uh, But you have a lot of, not a large sample size. <clears throat> Once you have a large sample size, you can use supervised learning. And supervised learning is try to find the features that actually relate to um, uh, relate to, to the, the groups uh, you are interested in. So they consider uh, the both X and both Y. And uh, similar to PCA and uh, PRCA is a supervised version of PCA. What you try to maximize is not a co, it's not a variance. It's maximize the covariance between X and uh, Y. So because it's supervised and PRCA can always produce some separation between the groups you're interested in, can always produce it. Why is because you have so many features and you can always find some features that seem related Okay, uh, it's uh, uh, omics data. Just by chance, we we mentioned about they all get some features that they correlate randomly correlated with certain with your group labels. Just because it's high dimensional, it, you can always find these features and produce separations that seems make you happy, but they're not necessarily true. And here's the result we do on uh, samples, difficult samples. And we see the PCA and from PCA to PRCA, clearly the separation is getting better. So the, I, uh, this is a um, captured patient. It's a, from human studies. So it's very ch challenging. We don't say clear separation, but this is very typical. And uh, if we apply to PRCA, we really get uh, uh, the bad separation. And uh, um, so, uh, in order to use PRCA, you do need a, a relatively large number of samples. And uh, <clears throat> here you show the dots, you can count it, probably uh, 16 and 70. So it's usually it's a good number of samples. And um, very low, you have six samples, three control, three groups, and you see there's patterns, you feel it's good uh, using PRCA, which is, I uh, personally have zero confidence if you have only three and three and you apply a um, supervised method. It's just, that makes sense. And, but once you get to uh, more samples like uh, here, and uh, now you have a lot of the leverages to test. Now here it uh, shows uh, what uh, happens with a clinical samples and complex cities. So you see good separations and you see the uh, PLSDA score plot on the right-hand side. And um, it is similar to PCA, um, but now you will see uh, the, the most uh, explained, the component one only explained 7.9% of variance in X. And in the component number four, X explained 9.3% of the variance in X. So, this is happens in uh, PRSDA just because PRSDA not maximize explain the variance of the X. It maximizes the covariance of the X uh, between X and Y. So this one explain the last number compared to component four, but this component actually explain most covariance between X and Y. So, but uh, the plotting is only shows X. So I get a lot of people asking uh, why whether this is valid. I just tell you this is valid because this is a not maximize the variance in X, it's a covariance. So the first one in PRSDA is the most predictive uh, because it's explained the covariance in Y. It isn't, and here it shows the variance in X. This is, a, uh, I don't think you will get samples like this, but we have uh, some of the users and some of the data is quite interesting. And uh, we just uh, make sure that, uh, you, if you see this, don't be too surprised. So I keep mentioning about the PCA overfitting um, because it's supervised and uh, it's it's high dimensional. Overfitting is so common. And in machine learning, how do we do, uh, what's overfitting? They have a huge book on that. And uh, and uh, what's overfitting means? Uh, over, you talk about overfitting, there's definitely this one called underfitting. So, uh, this is your data on the uh, orange dots, and you want to fit them. 
So if you fit nicely about which, uh, uh, which is the model generated, and this is blue line here, and a lot of random variation across this, it is uh, all fine looks. But you fit a street line, which few, few, very few parameters, you go to underfit because some is high, have a higher variance. But if you want to try to fit every dots and you use a lot of parameters and you're going to overfit just uh, because uh, you want to make everything. So overall, the overfitting is very common. It's better to use a very advanced algorithm, especially with nonlinear like neural network or stuff. So many parameters you can adjust. You will make sure every data uh, can data point can be fitted in this model, but it's capture noise. So at a certain time, it's not a capture meaningful patterns, it capture noise, what means overfitting. So overfitting is so typical in machine learning, but we need to really uh, be cautious about that. How we deal with that, there's two approaches. One is called a cross validation. And the cross validation is, uh, uh, is try to split your data into different uh, compartments and you uh, sections and you use a part to change and use the not used one to test. So the, for example, here we showed, we have like uh, 300 samples, uh, 200 unit chain and uh, 100 unit test. Then you do that another 200 chain and test. And uh, basically you just do it three times. <clears throat> and if the model is robust, you have good training and you should have good testing because it capture real signal. The model based on the two thirds of data actually can work very well on the test data just because you capture real signal and this signal is, is true. But if you test it 100%, but here it's like 15%, 14%, it really means you capture noise. So it's very, very clear, right? And so the cross validation is very typical machine learning. And uh, as long as you have enough samples, we can do it easily. So there's a huge difference between training and, uh, training and testing result. That means the model is overfitting. Okay. And uh, uh, sometimes the people, if you have a less number of samples, you do the cross validation, you get a result. Sometimes oh good, sometimes not good. Why is just because if you have a, a smaller number of samples, you happens to have like uh, all the training contains all the cases, and the testing is actually control. And you're changing on the cases and pretty control, you're going to have very bad performance, right? So this part is um, unavoidable if you're doing a random splitting and your data is unbalanced or, or have this kind of issues. And uh, sometimes you can do in force them to do more balanced sampling, which you need to really have a percentage I must this random sampling from case and control, and you can do it. In MetaBalanced, actually, we force them to do the balanced sampling to avoid that. So, it's, so you always get a very stable result. And the other task is called a leave one out cross validation. So if you have a small number of samples, what you can do is you chain uh, all the samples except the one and uh, do it. It just takes, if you have 20 samples, you can do 20 times. 19 to chain, predicting the one, and uh, just do it. So this is more stable. Overall, that machine learning favor, like uh, five or seven cross validation. Three is fine. If you have thousand samples, I can I can tell you, you don't, three cross validation will be fine because that's, that's a lot of samples and you can get the very stable result. But if you really have just 20 samples or 10 samples, you don't have much choice. You want to get a stable result, it's a leave one out cross validation. <laughs> So what the result you will get is about for PSDA. We do try to capture some of the measurement. One is called a prediction accuracy. And basically how many times you predict right. And but for PSDA, which is actually have some, because PSDA uh, traditionally is like a regression. They can capture this uh, R square, Q square. And um, R square is that uh, uh, what's the variance is uh, captured by the model. And uh, this one is the square is actually cross validated. How it's called the, uh, cross validated square. So all of this is uh, so you like Q squared more robust. We 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 use Q squared to to um, guiding our choice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the another one we talked about cross validation. Another one called permutation, and uh, and we already touched about using permutation to compute empirical p values. So you should be uh, be uh, familiar with what permutation try to do. So uh, now we actually try to test, it's not ca calculated p-values. What we try to cast, test is the class difference if we permute the uh, um, uh, permute sample labels. So um, uh, if we permute the class labels and we try to run PLCA and we can actually get that to 
built for separations. And how many times we get separations like uh, further away compared to the original one? Okay, this is uh, similar to how many times we get the mean difference. Now we we compute how many times we get the center of this uh, new separations is different, and we can compute that uh, empirical p values. Actually, we can think about the same thing. So if uh, we get uh, our original label uh, and uh, furthest, and even you use PLSDA, you get some separation, but it's not as far away from the original one. So you do get confidence, right? So they try to please us, but still original give you the strongest signal. So overall, this give you another layers of confidence. Permutation tell you whether uh, your um, data separation capture some real signals. And the cross-validation actually tell you how good it is. So um, uh, cross-validation tell your prediction accuracy is R square, Q square. So um, for those, if you really understand what uh, uh, the data looks like uh, or how it uh, can be interpreted and you want to see the citations, and we do in almost every, uh, every uh, figures, we give you uh, some interpretation and literary reference you can click and see there. I'm not going to touch very details because some of you actually very comfortable using the current level of interpretation. Some of you require very precise and uh, you just click and see on that talk. So there's also, we have a forum and people actually discuss, we have more details. So another result called the VIP score. Uh, VIP is a very variable importance in projection, but there's also some other abbreviation people are saying it. So it's a weighted sum of squared correlation between the PLSDA composition and original uh, variables. And uh, it claim to summarize the, uh, the, the contribution better than the, just using the loading plot. So this is the basic part based on the publication people want to use it. So we pro provide this in the PSD result. Usually you, if we have P more than one and people think that's a potential biomarker. And here is that uh, uh, the VIP score, here is the mini heat map and shows how many uh, classes. If you have 10, 10 classes, you'll have 10 uh, mini heat map corresponding to which uh, changes there and uh, give you some uh, information about uh, where it's going to be. So um, I think I have mm, 10 more minutes. I think I'll be about finished uh, on time. So last part is performance mirror and RC curve analysis. So um, we already touched on the supervised learning and we know that uh, supervised learning is very susceptible to uh, overfit. So overfit means that you capture noise and you can do it very well on the training. But when you're testing real data you never seen before and perform poorly, that means model capture some random signals and it's not as good as you claimed. If you talk about 95, when I testing real data, you tech actually became 65. That's uh, that's overfitting. That's uh, people, if you invest money on that and 65 is not as useful, especially in a clinical setting. So, uh, how do we ask? So we need a more, how to say, more robust measure of um, classification. And uh, the simple one, if we use balanced data, and uh, we just do the accuracy, uh, like uh, if we predict nine out of thirteen uh, correct, and uh, it's nineteen sixty nine percent accuracy, and the other called the error rate. So if you get accuracy, you minus uh, use one minus accuracy, you get thirty one. So it's both is common. Okay, uh, it's especially you need a quick, simple, intuitive measure. This is all good. Uh, just uh, it's done working when you have imbalanced data. So especially this is for clinical. It's very meaningful. Uh, most people are healthy and very few people are actually sick like HIV and cancer. And if you use that, uh, uh, the population doing that cancer stuff, if I predict everybody is healthy and I can get a very high accuracy because um, if it's 1,000 people, I predict only five is cancer. I, I have 99.5% accuracy, but it's totally missed the point because the goal is try to detect these five cancer patients. So, um, uh, in clinical, they actually have a different measurement. It's not just accuracy. They use a false, true positive, false positive, and true negative, false negative, and uh, finally sensitivity and specificity. So uh, this one is uh, very important if you have a biomedical background, you want to talk in the clinical settings and because our doctor is talking about this sensitivity specificity. So uh, what's, uh, what's the true positive is that if uh, 
if you actually positive, you predict it positive, and you you this is called true positive. What's true negative is as healthy, and you predict the healthy is true negative. Okay, so in that case, they really have a clear difference between positive and negative because you are sick or uh, or healthy. This is a positive and negative. In between is false positive and uh, false positive, uh, false positive and false negative. So overall, the sensitivity is that how good you can detect uh, um, the patient from from uh, all available patient and specificities. If you see they are, they are healthy and how good they are truly healthy. So overall, all of them is, is important, okay? And uh, for diagnosis. And this is when I showed if uh, our two population is not uh, clearly separated, they have some spreading and spreading overlap. And you can see in between, if you make some uh, claim, this is positive or negative, there's some risk, you are misdiagnosis. And it could be either false positive, false negative. And so uh, a measurement of this is, uh, um, is just uh, sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity is true positive divided by true positive uh, plus false negative. This is all the people with, this, with the disease. And this is when you actually diagnose with the uh, disease. So this is your sensitivity. And specificity, specificity is true negative versus the true negative plus false positive. So it's all the healthy person and you claim they are negative to they are healthy. So they're really telling how good you're telling they are not, how good you're telling they are true. So sensitivity is how good you claim is positive, is truly positive. Specificity is how truly you claim they are healthy and they are actually healthy. So all of this is critically important in clinical. Okay, so we want to actually combine them, and uh, in, in part because sensitivity and specific is two different things. We need to balance them. How do we have the right balance? And one tool is called the RC um, curve. RC curve is called receiver operating characteristic curve, and uh, and they do have a historical names. So we eventually try to balance them both. So. Uh, uh, if you have these two populations and you um, have different cutoff and you're going to have different uh, um, positive, uh, true positive, false positive, false negative, true negative. So you just, for each cutoff, what it, what's that uh, false positive uh, uh, sensitivity or specificity? So you can have different cutoff, have different data points and just draw connecting all of them. And you're able to get this curve, this curve called RC curve. And you want to maximize the uh, the area on the curve. So somewhere here, you have the right balance of the positive uh, sensitivity and the specificity. But of course, this is a, a mathematically maximize the area. But in clinically, and you actually have different costs associated with it. You can actually use this weight to adjust and push it to be highly specific or highly sensitive to this. It's really this one is uh, this selection is based on the mathematically, but in reality, you have different costs. So you can always push into higher or lower and because that's by adding a weight. So um, in clinical, if you really go to like 95%, that's a very, very good performance. 85% actually very good uh, already, but if you uh, have the below 18%, that's really, really, uh, you. if you want 70% is quite common and uh, it's, 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 you can publish it, but once you go, go to uh, uh, 16 something and close to this, it's, um, it's uh, not useful. And uh, if you see 100%, you have to think I'm uh, overfitting because 100% is uh, in clinical, it's very rare. And uh, a lot of times you need to do a lot of, lot of the uh, studies across centers, multi-populations, okay? So, um, um, we have a lot of other supervised methods and such as OPS, orthogonal projection of, to, of latent structures and support vector machine random forest logistic regression. They are both available in MetaBanalyst. So if you have chance, you can explore and we are happy to help you. Uh, Simca is this uh, commercial and proprietary. We don't have it, but overall that we believe and based on other people's on our own study, they are not necessarily better. Okay, it's just, uh, that's uh, OPRSDA, PRSDA, and support like machine random forest. They really handpicked, so very robust. Okay, they are available. So um, data analysis progression. So this is really uh, 
your uh, your guide is uh, started started from follow the simple one like univariate, and if you go to multivariate, and uh, uh, think about the PCA, which is just tell you about the data whether there's some patterns. Okay, if the, the, you have a lot number of large number of samples, and you do see some patterns, you want to separate them. You can use supervised, um, the like um, a PSDA. Um, but keep in mind is that um, uh, cross validation permutation are important. Do not jump. Hey, I see patterns. I want to write a paper. Just be cautious. If you only have about ten sample each. Uh, and probably you can only do some universal test, t test ANOVA is okay. You do a PC is okay. But I get people asking, how can I get better separations? I, uh, my P, P, imperial p-value is very low. I see they have six samples you want to PSDA. And basically you cannot do it. It's just nobody can do it. And you have to have a large number of samples to the supervised uh, uh, classification and permutation. So I think uh, I'm right on time.